They were naked, lying side by side, and both men were covered in deep scratches all over their body and second to third degree burn marks on random places throughout their skin. Both men were completely drained of blood. Today, I'm not only going to be sharing with you just missing person reports, but also terrifying first-hand accounts from park rangers who've worked at this same national park. Get ready, because this episode will send chills down your spine. October 9, 1949, two students known as Bruce Gerling and David Divot disappeared in the Rocky Mountains National Park. What's interesting about these two boys' case is that they too had gone disappearing right around the same area as Joe Halpern, the Bear Lake area. On October 11th, just two days after they had been reported missing, a search had ensued. The search party had extended from the college all the way to the Rocky Mountain National Park, having a mix of individuals from both places, right near the Bear Lake area near Estes Park for the pair of students. What had happened was that this pair of students had gone out hiking with 40 plus members of the Aggies Hiking Club on Sunday, October 9th. Out of the 40, 11 of them dropped to Grand Lake to hike to Bear Lake from the west. At Grand Lake, it was there that Bruce and David were with nine other members of the group, while the other nine continued on their way to Bear Lake to meet with the rest. Bruce and David, for whatever reason, broke away from the group to stop at a shelter cabin. And unfortunately, the pair's presence was not even noticed as missing until a day afterwards when the entirety of the group had returned to campus. The hikers even mentioned that they were hit by a snowstorm and felt that this missing pair would somehow be okay due to them both being very warmly clothed and had food on them, and they would know how to weather the storm. Upon learning this, the park rangers and search party headed immediately to the cabin that Bruce and David had apparently stopped at, but after they arrived, they noted quickly that there was no sign of them anywhere, not inside or out or anywhere in the surrounding area. And they realized in that moment that they were in deep trouble due to the bad weather it would be almost impossible to find Bruce and David. And not only would the search be difficult, but they might only be trying to find bodies at this point due to the frigid, freezing cold temperatures at night, and these boys now had spent a total of three nights in sub-freezing temperatures. Out of desperation, the Army Mountaineers were called in. These are tough men, they're trained alpinists, they're used to dealing with deep snow and bad weather conditions. And so once they were called into the search on Wednesday for these two students, everybody felt like they were that much closer to finding the location of these two boys. But even with the enlisted help, National Park officials still had very little hope of finding the pair alive. And to make matters even worse, they weren't even reported until a day after they had gone missing. And the rangers went on to say that the call of them missing could not have come at a worse time due to them being hit with a heavy snowstorm that same day that was so bad it had closed down the entire area. After speaking with the group they were last seen with, they had a pretty good idea of where they were last seen and the direction they were headed, so they had good information to go off of, but it still would not help that much. Fortunately for David and Bruce, the pathway from Grand Lake to Bear Lake was clear and should not have been something that was easily strayed away from. So the entire search party HQ'd at Bear Lake, while some began traveling back towards Grand Lake in hopes of finding any evidence or signs that David and Bruce might have gone by. But it didn't take long before everybody to realize the search was not working as they had planned, because they were finding nothing at all. No signs of life, and more importantly, no signs of David or Bruce at all. And on that same day the Alpinists were called in, a call for help was sent to the Camp Carson Army Training Center located at Colorado Springs. So an officer and 14 individually picked men from the 14th Regimental Combat Team were dispatched to the scene. The University of Colorado Mountain Rescue Specialist also offered their services. However, Professor Charles Hutchinson was asked by rangers to stand by to replace the tiring men that worked in five working groups that Wednesday morning. Out of the five total search groups, two of them were sent from Bear Lake to cover the other trails around Grand Lake. A third group headed for the glacier at the base of Flat Top and another along the canyon north of the mountain towards the A&M's Mountain Club which Bruce and David were hoping to be pledged into. And even with all that ground being covered, they still did not find any trace of David or Bruce. Morale was low, people were getting ready to close off the search, but some members were not ready to call it off just yet 
because they were still driven, they were determined to find some inkling of David and Bruce. And so this group of five guys, a specially trained group of mountain troopers and forest rangers, had refused to completely give up on the search and continued on. The area around Bear Lake that Bruce and David got lost in is heavily rugged, mountainous, steep, and thickly wooded. It's also subject to deep snow and freezing temperatures. At this point during the search, the majority of them believe that they were not looking for live survivors, but in fact bodies or some sort of evidence that would point people to what happened to David and Bruce. With these kinds of weather conditions and freezing temperatures, there's no way that they could have held out and survived for this long. The man in charge of directing this search, who also was the chief forest ranger, Barton Herschler, when talking about the area that these two students were lost in, claimed that it was so dense it would be necessary to search the same trails and paths several times times over. And so these five men who participated in this search would go over the areas back and forth all around Bear Lake several times. And we're talking extremely cold, extremely rugged terrain here. This was not an easy search by any stretch of the means. And after so much physical intensity, two of the five had to drop out for the rest of the day. And the following day, Barton Herschler made the announcement that after all this intensive searching, that they still had failed to retrieve any trace of Bruce and David or any inkling to where they could have gone. He claimed they had been all over the trails twice from end to end and they'd gone over every conceivable path they could possibly find that Bruce and David would have possibly taken. Due to bad weather and strong winds, Monday night and Tuesday had piled snowdrifts at least five foot high, covering cracks and crevices and nooks and crannies all between the rocks and in the area. So if anybody was to fall in these places, they wouldn't even know. And now that we're finally 70 plus years later from these two boys missing, no trace of them has yet to be found. So then we have to start thinking of the possibilities. Is it possible they fell into a crevice or down into a canyon? It's not likely since the area was covered and searched so in depth. However, with the heavy snowfall and snowdrifts, it is possible that their bodies did get covered. So then we're left with the other possibilities, which is them leaving the trail. And if they were experienced like they were, they would have no reason to abandon their group and completely go off trail, making it almost near impossible to find them even more so with the extreme weather conditions they faced. Maybe it's possible they were chased by some large predatory animal and then thrown off the trail, getting lost and then dying. That is unlikely because there was no evidence at all found of any animal predation. So the only other option is that something had caused them to go off trail to where they would not be found. Is it possible they encountered something or someone that would drive them to go off the trail to possibly hide or seek shelter or safety, with them in turn either dying or getting lost? lost. This is all just mere speculation, but it doesn't really make sense when you have some of the most experienced mountaineers going over the same trails and paths multiple times only to turn up empty-handed. And when you look at the trail and the area in which David and Bruce covered, there's only so many spots you could possibly go. So for them to just vanish without a trace baffles the mind of everybody working on this case. On the 17th of October, the search was officially suspended. Even the Tucson Daily Citizen reported this in the paper, that the search for two Colorado students lost for eight days in the snowy heights of the Rocky Mountain National Parks has been abandoned by the organized search effort. It was dropped after a conference between Colorado A&M officials parents of the boys, park rangers, an army search detachment from Camp Carson, and members of the school hiking club, dean of students. It was then that a further search was concluded to be futile. Any and all hope of finding David and Bruce alive in any condition is no longer possible. However, Bruce's father had a hard time accepting the disappearance and untimely death of his son, and in refusing to accept the circumstances, he himself would go on and continue searching alone, oftentimes with a small party for almost an entire year after the disappearance took place. William Gerling, Bruce Gerling's father, had given up on the search for his son, even though he would continue to go on and search for years afterwards. William, just like the students, the rangers, the alpinists, never found anything, and the entire case still remains a mystery. This incident that I'm about to share was submitted to me by an ex-park ranger who had worked in the Rocky Mountains National Park in 1981 and they wrote this. I'm running to you because I feel that the incidents I experienced in Rocky Mountain National Park in 1981 
are somehow related to your interest. In February of 1981, I was a member of Search and Rescue and from my fire department, assigned to respond to an overdue hiker on the Flat Top Mountain Trail at Rocky Mountain National Park. We arrived at the trailhead about 2 a.m. on the Saturday morning. The trailhead is located between Estes Park and Grand Lake off of Highway 34, also known as Trail Ridge Road, just before reaching all of the peaks along this road. There are many backcountry campgrounds for hikers and climbers who venture into this area for its beauty during summer months. The hiker was a local individual who was hiking with friends on Saturday prior. He had not been feeling well, so he decided to stay at the top of the Flat Top Mountain while his friends decided to go on down to their camp in Chasm Meadows where my team and I would also be spending the night. We started out at 2 a.m. for the five to six mile hike up to Flat Top Mountain, where we met three other search and rescue teams from Estes Park and Grand Lake Fire Department, along with an Air Force rescue helicopter from Buckley AFB at Fort Carson. They would assist us if we needed help within this very rugged terrain of the Rocky Mountain National Park. Cell phone service is almost non-existent due to its geography altitude and forest canopy coverage. We started our hike up the top of Flat Top Mountain Trail, which was very dark since it was so early in the morning. After hiking a few miles, we met one of the original hiker's friends who gave us a completely different story than what we were told. He had advised us that they had retreated the area originally after being chased by a large unidentified humanoid with glowing eyes. When asked for more of a description, he described it as half man, half bear but also looking different. His claim is that his friend who wasn't feeling very well was actually took and that was an excuse meant to cover up the ridiculous story that we were just told. He also acted very erratic, could not control his breathing and judging by his behavior, it was evident he was not involved in foul play. When we had arrived at the top of the Flat Top Mountain, we set up a tent and began searching on foot. We covered the whole area around this mountain but found nothing. The Air Force Rescue Helicopter was able to cover the area just beyond our capabilities and that terrain, which they also came up with negative results. The next day, another team from my department returned a hike into Chasm Meadows with two dogs to search for any signs of foul play or harm done by this individual who may or may not have wandered off on his own accord because he was not feeling well, judging by what we were told from the first group of friends that left. This did not produce any results either, and they were not even able to get his scent. However, it is speculated that he had gone down to the many creeks within this valley, leading back to Highway 34 where he was last seen. In conclusion, I must admit that the behavior of this individual was not normal at all, and it is most likely that he went off on his own accord due to being in poor health. However, we were called out because nobody could reach him by radio or cell phone after several attempts to contact him or the witnesses throughout the day on Saturday when they still had service and were camping within a few miles of the area where there was cell phone coverage. The friends had waited until Sunday morning before contacting us with this information, so it only makes me wonder if someone saw something while hiking through these mountains as well as this individual was actually missing or on his own accord. As far as the one friend who made the claims about an unidentified creature chasing them and the other group of friends who claimed he was just sick and had wandered off and stayed up on the mountain, one of them is believed to be lying and we weren't sure who. But the one man who had shared his story that him and his friend were actually chased, he had a very difficult time telling the story and appeared to be terrified. And so all of us had a very difficult time believing anything he said, and it seemed to me that maybe his imagination was running wild, which is not uncommon for people in situations like this. After questioning him further, it turns out from him that the missing friend was actually chased by this large bear man, as he described it, and detailed it as it's standing on two legs with a distorted face, and even knew their names and spoke it after it chased them. He still stood by his claims even after everything that this being is what took his friend and that it was not a case of him feeling ill and staying up top flap top mountain. That is just the story that his other friends came up with because they knew the real story would never be believed by anybody. After hearing these details, we had thoroughly questioned the other group of friends, the ones who originally told us that he was last seen on top flap top mountain and feeling ill 
but they declined any validity of the other friend who claimed he was taken by the bear man, almost as if they wanted no part in his reality. To this day, we have no idea what he saw, and we don't know why there's two different stories circulating, but more importantly, there's no traces of him. This took place roughly about 30 years ago during the later winter, early spring months. There were five of us from Grand County Search and Rescue who hiked up the Flat Top Mountain Trail. The missing individual, whom I remember the name, Eric, was never found. I was not made aware of his last name. Is it possible that Eric and friends truly encountered something from the supernatural realm? And while a group of friends, terrified to tell the true story of what happened to Eric, came up with a lie that he wasn't feeling well and stayed up on top of the mountain to cover their butts. So then why did the one friend go on to tell Search and Rescue about it? The discrepancy between stories and never actually finding Eric is what truly bothers me about this case. Regardless of the outcome or the circumstances, the fact that Eric was never found is completely tragic. It was August 15, 1933, on a cool, misty morning, the day that Joe Halpern, 22 years old, had simply vanished. Joe was a very intelligent, highly thought of Chicago graduate that would disappear in this very national park. On this morning, Joe was with his old friend Sam Garrick, and they would arrive in the Rockies with one destination in mind. Bell Lake Trailhead. This morning was set out to be like any other morning. It was just going to be two friends going to go enjoy themselves out in the great outdoors. There was to be nothing amiss. And it was here at the Bell Lake Trailhead where the car would be discovered completely untouched and without its owner at all. The story goes that Joe and Sam had began their ascent up the Flat Top Mountain. But unlike so many other hikers and adventurers, Joe would never make it back down. It was on the same journey that Joe and Sam would be traveling throughout South Dakota and eventually ending in the Rocky Mountains. This was a western road trip they had planned and were taking currently and starting in Chicago, eventually ending here. Along with them were Sam and Joe's parents. And once they finally had made it into the Rockies, the group had split into two separate pairs. Joe's parents had wanted to do some lighter hiking while Joe was in the mood for something a little more extreme. And the story goes that once Joe and Sam had finally ascended Flat Top Mountain, Sam was completely done. He was finished, he was not keen on moving on because he was simply too exhausted. But Joe was not done yet and still persisted to go on. And because of this deep found hunger for adventure, Joe was not just gonna sit around and wait for Sam, he was gonna continue ahead towards Taylor Peak. So Sam agreed with what he wanted to do and said, all right, well, let's make plans to meet back up at the Bear Lake Trailhead by 2.30 p.m. And right then and there, they go off on their separate ways. And this would be the very last time that anybody would see Joe Halpern again. So 2.30 p.m. rolls around and Sam is at the Bear Lake Trailhead like they had discussed earlier in the day and he's waiting for Joe, but Joe never shows up. And so finally 6.30 p.m. rolls around and he's still waiting for Joe to return. And he keeps giving him more time. He keeps waiting, figuring, you know what? Maybe he's taking his time. Maybe he's resting. There has to be a logical reason why he's taking so long. And finally, 9.30 p.m. rolls around and now Sam begins to panic and is faced with the reality of the situation that something is very wrong here. And so he makes his way over to the ranger station as quick as he can, explains the situation, and tells them the last time he was seen, what they were doing, and where he was last at. And a search party was put together not long afterwards. There's not much documentation about how many rangers were involved in the search, but a group of them were equipped with electric lights and began to look for any signs of Joe in the adjacent area. And like some sort of bad omen or streak of bad luck, not long after the search had began, the entire area was hit with torrential downpours, windstorms, making searching extremely tough. And the weather conditions persisted for some time, hours, and even days. And so this group of rangers, desperately trying to find Joe, would search on and off for the next six days, trying their hardest to find him. And finally, after six full days of searching, battling the wind, battling torrential rain, and not finding a clue of what happened to Joe, they decided to finally conclude their search. The results were that there was never a trace of Joe ever found. There was no evidence. There was no clothing. There was no DNA evidence. Although in 1933, their ability to track DNA evidence was very limited. But they were convinced that Joe had just managed to disappear into thin air. But Joe's father was never able to fully let his son's disappearance go, and rightfully so. 
I mean, what parent is just going to lie down and accept the death of their child? And so he kept an open line of communication with the FBI afterwards. And there was even hope lingering around afterwards for the family because there were rumors that people were seeing Joe across the country, but nothing was ever fully confirmed. And so later on, the family would have their own go at trying to understand and find Joe themselves. And so fast forwarding in time to 1998, Joe's family would try and get a better understanding of what happened to the relative. One of Joe's future relatives, Ronald Halpern, spoke about his father Bernard Halpern passing away in 1998 and finding photos and information of Joe tucked in books or in letters. Roland went on to say this to describe his father Bernard, that when it came to Joe, his father was very stoic and they never really heard or talked a lot about Joe. And the only thing that they would hear from him is to never go out hiking alone because that's what happened to his brother, Joe. Roland, who was born almost 20 years after Joe went missing in the Rocky Mountain National Park, never knew the full circumstances of the situation. However, since 1998, he's undertaken the mystery himself and has gone into full investigation mode, trying to get every piece of evidence or information he possibly can that his own father kept from him about Joe, even going as far as tracking down letters or any evidence that Joe existed back in the 1930s, which was primarily in the form of handwritten letters. He, at one point or another, had found multiple letters of his father searching and searching for his little brother. Joe, decades later after he was still considered missing, finding numerous letters pleading to the National Park Service to help find his brother, only to get denied. Unfortunately, as the search for information would continue, Roland was unfortunately never able to find out what exactly happened to Joe, and it's been widely understood that he just simply disappeared, and there's no evidence to this very day in 2022 what happened to him and why. It has been 88 plus years since his passing, and there has not been a trace of him yet discovered. Perhaps we will never find out what happened to Joe and what his final moments were like. This is a story that was submitted to me by the grandson of a park ranger who had worked in the Rocky Mountains National Park back in the 80s and 90s. The story that was shared with him was shared when he was still alive last, and he has told this story to his grandson multiple times but unfortunately passed away in December of 2021 due to COVID complications. And to honor him and his experiences while working in search and rescue, the grandson feels it's most appropriate to tell his story. Now his grandfather had many bizarre stories, often encountering the paranormal, the supernatural, strange lights in the sky. And one of many stories that he had told his grandson was when he worked primarily in search and rescue for well over 30 years at various national parks. He eventually met his grandmother and married, and the two moved to Colorado in the early 1980s, where he would actually help assist in one of the more famous cases of 1983 of Rudy Motor, who went missing in the mountains of Colorado. Years later in the early 1990s, his grandfather was called out to a search for two missing persons in the Rocky Mountain National Park. The strange thing about this case is their lack of identities ever given and how the case was handled. These two men were experienced hikers and should have had the knowledge needed to survive that night when they didn't come back down the mountain. Even though that evening, they had told multiple rangers and eyewitnesses what they were doing that day and what time they were going to come down. But due to the freezing conditions, his grandfather was aware right away they would not have the best luck in finding them due to weather. After a few hours into the search, both bodies had been discovered by a chopper who had been flying overhead of their location due to seeing lights moving around on top of a ridge at around 11 p.m. Certain at first, this was them waving around flashlights or something to try and capture the attention of a chopper, it turns out the lights weren't from them at all. That's another mystery, his grandfather had told him, like something of the supernatural leading search and rescuers to these very bodies. The chopper at the time did not know this and led people and believed that this was the location of the two men, which it was. So when search and rescue got to them, to this very location, they found both men in a very disturbing situation. They were naked, lying side by side, and both men were covered in deep scratches all over their body and second to third degree burn marks on random places throughout their skin. Both men were completely drained of blood and were both missing their left eyes and their tongues. They had not died of exposure 
and they appeared as if they were taken and dropped off here on top of this ridge, which baffled everybody on the search because it was so impossible and they had never found something so horrendous. After their bodies were examined closer, the conclusion was that they were both exposed to extremely high temperatures, considering portions of their skin were boiled and severely burned, and both men had died with a look of terror on their face. Perplexed by these strange yet disturbing findings, the grandfather and the rest of the search and rescue team made their way back to base camp where they discussed in depth what had happened and what they theorized happened. There were also no tracks anywhere around where they were found, even though their bodies were lying in snow. The grandfather thoroughly believed that these two men were killed by something terrifying in the woods that night. This was one of the only few cases he had ever worked on where the grandfather was told by his superiors to not speak about the case and was forced into signing a contract that would prohibit him of ever speaking about it. He says it wasn't an NDA, but something else. And everybody on that small team that evening that saw those bodies had to do the exact same. And he also talked about just how weird the lack of identification was on those victims that he never got the chance to learn their names. Very unlike any other cases he's worked on where the victim's name or family is well known from the start, as years have gone on, he actually got in contact with David Politis, read all his books, which only further validated his own experiences back in the early 1990s, to what degree the relationship turned into, I'm not sure, but they spoke on several occasions or so, I'm told. But he felt that to honor his grandfather, sharing this story would be the best case scenario, and that he always told this story growing up, and it really scared this story submitter, and believes that even though his grandfather's dead, there is something out there that needs to be known about. This report was sent to me by a ranger who had worked at the Rocky Mountain National Park in the summer of 2009. They had worked as a ranger in Estes Park for about seven years. and the last few years, they spent working as a backcountry ranger on the Trail Ridge Road. Trail Ridge Road is the highest continuous road in North America and is located inside the park between Grand Lake and Estes Park, where it runs along the Continental Divide at 12,000 feet plus above sea level. There are several places that are only accessible by hiking or horseback riding into them from one of the two trailheads along the Trail Ridge Road since there's no roads leading directly to these locations, except within the Rocky Mountain National Park boundaries, which are usually restricted to backcountry users. So this encounter happened in August of 2009 right at the Wild Basin Trailhead. There's a trailhead parking lot that is accessible by car where this ranger had encountered this creature about three miles or five kilometers from the Wild Basin Range, which was his workstation for roughly four plus years. The ranger station is located on Maureen Park Road between Grand Lake and Estes Park, not far from Allen's Park, Colorado. The Forest Service Road to this trailhead from Highway 34 has been now closed for several years due to Colorado flooding in September years back. But there was always ways to get into it by hiking or horseback riding down Moraine Park Road, about three miles past a campground, and then cross country up Burnt Timber Creek until you reach an old access road where the trailhead is located. The ranger's day started off as normal as they were assigned a horse to take out and feed. The horses were kept in corrals that were located above the trailhead parking lot which was only accessible by foot or horseback, just next to the ranger station. So, after feeding them, this ranger saddled up the mare, who was quite docile and easy to ride, and then hiked back down past the parking lot, about a quarter mile where it opened up into an old logging road that had actually been converted to an old access road for park service vehicles after Trail Ridge Road had been closed for several years. They turned into this access road, which led them down through the Aspen slash Pine Forest, passing alongside large granite boulders until they reached one of the most beautiful alpine meadows they had ever seen, filled with wildflowers, tall grasses where he let his horse graze for about 20 minutes while he sat on top of a large rock that overlooked the valley, eating his lunch. After finishing, he continued down through this meadow until it started to curve along the side of one huge granite boulder, which had been left there after a glacial movement many years ago. As they passed around this giant boulder, on their right side, facing downhill, was another massive granite rock wall that rose up steeply into aspens mixed with pine trees 
where it also opened up into another small subalpine level meadow just below it to the right. After rounding the boulder, immediately he notices an odd looking creature standing at the edge of this small meadow just inside the pine trees. It was facing downhill toward a trail that passed through it and out across the valley floor below them. This creature's head was large and oval shaped with no neck. It seemed to be attached directly to its shoulders, which appeared to be covered in long brown hair, although from his distance, there was only enough detail for them to see the overall silhouette, since it kind of had a reddish brown hued skin slash fur that almost shimmered under the sunlight, as well as dark red eyes due to the reflection off rocks where he could not distinguish pupils since they were so far away. The creature stood up straight between around 8 to 9 feet tall, he estimates, but could not distinguish its exact height or any other body details since it was several hundred yards away. Standing at the edge of a cliff with pine trees next to it that blocked his view from the sides. At this point, his horse became spooked when she noticed the creature and began to act nervous as if she sensed something wasn't quite right about what they were seeing. So the ranger tries to calm her down by stroking her, talking to her soothingly into her ears. And then after a few minutes of that, he talked her closer toward where she was grazing in hopes they would be able to get closer for a better viewing. As soon as the horse got within about 50 to 60 yards of this creature, it turned around quickly while facing downhill, then walked slash ran on two legs into the pine trees disappearing from view as it went up a steep hillside where the ranger could not follow it since there were no trails into the area and the train was far too rocky to ride his horse into. He was very puzzled by what he had just witnessed and thought that maybe this creature had been some kind of sickly bear or deer due to its shape and coloration and height and lack of a neck, but something didn't quite seem right. So later on in the day, when his head started clearing after lunch, it dawned on him that even though this creature appeared to be walking on two legs like a human, with hands attached to its arms while running through the forest vegetation, it all just seemed so impossible which then led to him questioning himself if what happened earlier was real, or if maybe he just imagined it, but he remembered that his horse even had responded strangely and acted different. And the more he thought about it, the more he became convinced that this was a real sighting and not something from his imagination. And it did not seem likely that this was some hiker due to the train around it, since he knew that nobody else at this time would be hiking into the wild basin trails that day, and there were no other people camping in the area since Moraine Park was closed at the time, it appeared that this creature was more than likely real. After trying to rationalize what might have caused his horse's reaction by thinking maybe she just sensed its presence before actually seeing it, but then dismissed the idea by thinking, how could a wild animal be so close without alerting others nearby? This ranger believes that it had ran up into this heavily wooded area where it can hide and watched the ranger and the horse sit down by the wildflowers for about 20 minutes in the alpine meadow below. When this ranger's shift had ended at around 4.30 p.m., they decided to hike back into the wild basin trails from the park area, hoping to find some kind of tracks or evidence of what had happened earlier in the day but found nothing unusual except for a few piles of old bear scat, which is common since bears are active throughout this area during the summertime. So for the longest time, they had just decided to keep this encounter to themselves. And as it stands currently, they are no longer employed since retiring back in 2011. And they had decided to share this story with me after listening to the Yosemite Secrets video and their Something in Yellowstone video. Is it possible that this anonymous park ranger witnessed a Bigfoot or some sort of Sasquatch creature that day in the Rocky Mountain National Park in Colorado? Some of you might even remember 27-year-old Rudy Motor, who in 1983 had made plans to visit the Rocky Mountains National Park. Unfortunately for Rudy, these would be the last plans he would ever make, because these plans were able to fully come to fruition in about mid-February of that year. And on February 13, 1983, Rudy, 
set off from Zimmerman Lake Trailhead of Colorado Highway 14 near Cameron's Pass. His original plan was pretty simple. There was nothing complex about it. He was only going to stay about two or three nights during a solo skiing and mountaineering trip right over Thunder Pass and finally down into the Ditch Camp 3 area. He made this plan well known to friends and family and so everybody was expecting Rudy to come back. This wasn't his first rodeo after all. His plan was to get to the first area and establish a base camp and then go from there. But Rudy would be seen for the very last time by friends right around the Zimmerman Lake area around 9 a.m. on February 13th. This was right before he departed for the last time. And while he had headed up the mountains, his friends were turning back, heading back towards the trailhead. Again, it is important to reiterate just how possible it is for experienced mountaineers and hikers to also go missing along with mountain rookies. Rudy was very well versed and experienced as a mountaineer, skier, and hiker. Rudy, who had a pretty extensive resume of experience spending two years in the German army as a mountaineer and also enlisting on two Himalayan expeditions, this man knew nature and knew what it was like hiking in the mountains in freezing conditions. So he knew what he was getting into. To. From a physicality level, he was very fit, very in shape, and very strong. But even with those physical attributes, the wisdom, and the knowledge, it still will not save him. Because six days later, on February 19th, Rudy would be officially reported missing. Rudy's roommate had reached out to the Laramie County Sheriff's Office, reporting that he should have been back by now and that he's worried something happened. And what started off as an initial investigation by law enforcement led and turned into a great search by the same day. And while search parties were all over the surrounding area, it turns out they found their first clue. A food cache who was belonging to Rudy was found at the mouth of Box Canyon on February 21st followed by a snow cave that was found only about 15 meters away from the food cache. But they could not work with much due to the heavy snowfall just two days before this. Even though the search would turn out negative, it was still four days of intensive searching, and there appeared to be no additional signs of Rudy in or around where he said he was going to be. This also includes the cave they found and around the food cache. An article from the Colorado Springs Gazette stated this at the time, 65 people, an avalanche dog, and four helicopters helicopters aided in Tuesday's search for Rudy. Searchers, they found no new clues to help locate Rudy. During the search, everybody was in high spirits and in hopes that they would find Rudy alive. And after finding the food cache, surely he had to be close by. They were hopeful in the fact they would at least find tracks or some evidence of him even being in the remote area, but to find nothing, it just did not make any sense. Unfortunately, due to the heavy snowfall that would come right after he left, it could easily blanket out any prints he would have left making it almost impossible to find him. Then, they begin believing that Rudy must have somehow fallen or gotten trapped underneath the snow, which is why they brought in the avalanche dogs. But unfortunately, even the dogs could not find any indication of his presence or ever being there. There was no scent, there was nothing. What's most troubling and disturbing about this case is you have somebody like Rudy who is such an experienced young mountaineer to just leave no trace behind whatsoever, not even a scent. And like all the others that we've spoken about in this episode, to just vanish without a trace and to have no conclusive end to what happened to Rudy is what is most unsettling. We are now coming up on almost 40 years since the disappearance of Rudy and there has still been no evidence found yet. Even things like his clothing or his skis should have been found at some point or another, but even these items have not been located yet. Maybe one day will we ever actually learn the truth of what happened to Rudy. Most importantly, I would love to hear your guys' take on what you all think happened to these individuals in today's stories. So be sure to leave a comment below, slap the like button if you have not got a chance to yet, and if you're new to the channel, be sure to go ahead and subscribe for more great videos coming your way. I got more missing stories, more park ranger stories, and a lot more exciting stuff down the pipeline. Stay tuned, you won't want to miss it.